Comrade, as you know, it's always fun to see all of you this time of the year with our friends from the People's Republic of China and from the D DPRK. We were hoping that the, um, uh, there will be a representative from the Cuban Embassy, they promised, but they are very short staff, so he said that there was a 5% chance he would not come. Being the optimistic sorts, we thought 95 showed a better chance of having him here, having him here not, not elsewhere, but the 5% has won, so he's not, he's not here, but he would have been very welcome to have him come, and we shall miss him because he's not, he's not here. This function we organize every year, and we try to combine as many revolutionary things as we can within the month of July. The most important, of course, is the anniversary of the ending of the American-led imperialist predatory war against the Korean people. Directly against the Korean people, but indirectly also against the Chinese and the, and, and, the, and the Soviet people. Today is the 58th anniversary of the ending of that war. It was an epic war in which principally the people of the DPRK, but assisted by their friends from the People's Republic of China and by the Soviet Union made tremendous contributions and it was the first time that American imperialism lost a war. It was a war that ended up, not in a peace treaty, but it ended up in a truce and one of the truces where no American general previously had to face a situation whereby the Americans did not win. In their history of existence for nearly 200 years up to then, they had never lost a war. They were used to walking into other people's countries and winning. But the Korean people, under the leadership of Comrade Kim Il-sung, and the Chinese people, under the leadership of Comrade Ma Zedong, <coughs> and the Soviet forces, under the leadership of Comrade Davis Stalin, taught American imperialism a lesson at a time when the world balance of forces was very much in favor of American imperialism. It has a, had a huge atomic arsenal which was a source then of, and has been since then, of American imperialism's uh, uh, intimidation of other people. Whenever they are in trouble, they threaten people with nuclear bombs. Although they did not have, on that occasion, the monopoly of nuclear weapons, because the Soviet Union had detonated its atomic bomb just, just a year earlier, but nevertheless, it was, they were new to the field. Americans had lots of weapons. And President Truman, Truman uh, wrote in his diary that he'd marked a number of Soviet cities the who were, which were to be bombed because of their help for the war uh, uh, on, 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 on the forces of, of, of liberation. And they in fact actually bombed Vladivostok. So it was something that the socialist countries were able to do together. To me the most important lesson, apart from others, of that is first that imperialism only understands the language of force. It does not understand logic, it does not understand argument. <laughs> on that, in that instance, the revolutionary force proved to be overwhelming and was able to defeat American imperialism with a whole dozen of its satellites, including our own country. There. The Labour government, the darling of the so-called communist parties, of the left-wing labor MPs and everything, was not only organizing NATO, but was actually waging war against the Korean people. That was the socialism of the Labor Party then, and that is the socialism of the Labor Party subsequently, which waged wars against the people of Iraq, against the people of Afghanistan, and now against the people of Libya. So the only way... The only way imperialism can be beaten as Chairman Ma used to say, imperialist butchers will never become Buddhas. You know, they, 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 they are knife-wielding butchers. And they have honey on their lips, but murder in their heart. You know, they talk the language of democracy. Our William Hague says, for example, in regard to Libya, Colonel Gaddafi must leave power, but we will allow him to stay in Libya. It's like, Colonel Gaddafi were to come, Mr. Haig must stop being the foreign secretary of this country, but we will allow him to live in London. And that would sound very peculiar, wouldn't it? And then he says, but of course the liberal people must exercise their own right to choose their own government. As long as he can choose that Gaddafi won't be in power, then the Libyan people have the right to choose their own government. Now, their language, 
has absolutely no connection with the, with the thought. They talk of democracy, they impose everywhere fascist dictatorship. I use the word advisedly, not hypo, alter, uh, you know, being hyperbolic. I really use it fascistic, because that's, that's what they are. What they're doing today is what Hitler used to do, invade country after country, and all, probably in the name of spreading democracy, bringing German civilization to the barbarians. There's, no, it, there's nothing much change. That's precise, precisely what they're doing. The second thing that I think we, the second lesson we can draw from the Korean War is that as long as the socialist countries are united, as long as they sing from the hem, same hymn sheet, as long as they enjoy the sport of the oppressed peoples of the world and the proletariat even in the centers of imperialism, there is no force on earth that can defeat them. It gives my party the greatest of pleasure to know that the relationship forged by the older generation, the relationship of friendship and support by the older generation of the Chinese and the Korean leaders is now being maintained by the present le le leadership. <laughs> there have been tremendous mutual exchanges of visits and cultural exchanges between the People's Republic of China and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. It gives us tremendous pleasure to see that. It's precisely because of that that imperialist attempts to bully to bully the DPRK are not succeeding because their attempts to split China from the DPRK have floundered, have failed, and I hope will always fail in the, in, the, in the future. The DPRK recognizes as a small country of 22, 23, 24 million people, the size of Wales, beautiful country, but small nevertheless in comparison with US imperialism. It stands firm on its principles and it relies on its strength. Precisely because it relies on its strength and it wants to defend itself and it has actually manufactured nuclear weapons and the systems of delivery, American imperialism, after a great deal of attempts at bullying, was forced to hold negotiations with a vice foreign minister, minister of the DPRK on Thursday and Friday of last week and it gives us tremendous pleasure that it took place. we should from this meeting demand is that the Korean War ended 58 years ago. Isn't it time that a peace treaty was signed between the DPRK and the United States of America? Is it not time that the truth, what is truth? It's, it's, a, it's a state of war still exists, but it's a truth they're not actually fighting, although some fighting continuously is instigated by US imperialism. Is it not time that a peace treaty was signed? And we should demand that the U.S. sign a peace treaty with the DR, DPRK to replace the truce so that the war, there is peace on the Korean Peninsula and there's no excuse whatever then for the stationing of 30 odd thousand American troops on the southern part of the Korean Peninsula. When the Soviet Union collapsed, Imperialism and its dim-witted ideologues, the journalists from Financial Times to the Sun were saying, wonderful, now there will be peace on earth. Because the, because the reason for war, i.e. a socialist country, has been removed from the scene. And what, what have we seen? As the Soviet Union was collapsing, war against Iraq. There has been war against Afghanistan. There is war in Libya. There has been war in Ivory Coast. There has been war in number of other places in Latin America and etc. <coughs> thousands and thousands of people continue to be killed every month as a result of imperialist wars. So it is not really the existence of socialist countries that causes war. It's the existence of imperialism. Unless imperialism is well dis destroyed and truly buried, there will be no peace on earth. People People who expect peace while imperialism still lasts, they behave like the, the, the pigeon in the Indian fable. 
The pigeon shuts its eyes when it, he sees the cat, thinking that if he can't see the cat, the cat won't see him. <laughs> no, the cat sees the pigeon and comes and draws. If we shut our eyes to the danger that imperialism presents, if we shut our eyes to the need for resistance against imperialism and building up the a united alliance of socialist countries, the socialist proletariat and the oppressed peoples of the world, then I'm afraid we'll be acting like the pigeon in that fable. And that story was taken to heart by the Indian countryside long while ago. Are we even more backward than people hundreds of years ago in India that we can't understand that? Or as the Chinese have a saying, the tree may prefer the calm, the wind will not subside. We may want peace, but we cannot have peace because the other side is warlike, is warmongering. And it's warmongering not because the individual representatives of it. Whether they're intelligent like Obama, or dim-witted like Bush, or general mediocrity. It's not because they're malicious people. They are representatives of a system. They're, they cannot behave in any other way. It's like expecting a nice police officer in a bourgeois country. <laughs> there are no nice police officers. I mean, they, they are trained to be nasty. This is their job to be nasty. They are a police force on behalf of a tiny minority and their job is to oppress people, to suppress people and behave badly. So you cannot expect imperialism to behave any better than it does. That's why people, social democrats, petty bourgeois, people who even call themselves communists, were really cock a hoop when Obama was elected as president. There are a lot of black people saying, ah, there's a black man in the White House, there will be liberation for black people. This man, in the course of three years, has oppressed more black people than Bush did during eight years. That's the truth of the matter. More bombs are being leashed on poor old little Libyans. What is Libya? Six and a half million people. What is Libya's armed forces compared with the combined air forces of all the imperialist countries? They're unleashing bombs. There is no soldiering honor in it. When the Nazis fought against America or Britain, of France, okay. they don't laugh when I say France, uh, <laughs> or, or when they fought against the mighty Soviet Union. Horrible fascists though they were, bandits though they were, cruel though they were, they still had to meet some standards of fighting against people who were powerful. There was some honor in a Nazi soldier fighting. There's no honor in our pilots going from 10 miles above the sky of Libya and dropping bombs on civilian uh, 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 locations, on water systems, on hospitals, on television transmitters. They bombed a transmitter yesterday in Libya and what was the excuse? We wanted to stop terror broadcasts. <laughs> now at that level, all the imperialist broadcasting systems should be perfect targets because they are the real broadcasts of the terrorists. <laughs> Comrades, I've already taken enough of your time, but we need to draw all these lessons. We need to pull together all the strings of the movement. Just as in the old Latin saying, all roads lead to Rome. All our struggles should work towards the defeat of imperialism. From the smallest thing to the biggest thing, we should go to working people and say, these are the people who tell you they've got to cut your pension rights. They've got to take away your education rights. They've got to take away your health system because we haven't got the money. But they have got the money to wage war. They have the money a million times at a time to throw a bomb, bomb, bomb on Libya. Can working people not see the connection? There's plenty of money to save the bankers. Hundreds of billions of pounds and dollars have been spent on saving the bankers. But there's no money for the health system. So it's not a shortage of money. In fact, the problem in the capitalist world is not shortage of capital, but surplus of capital which cannot find proper avenues of investment. When it cannot find proper avenues of investment, it's used in all kinds of speculative bubbles. Mm. And when the bubbles bust, the banks that have participated in that bubble lose the money and there is a systemic failure and the near meltdown of the imperialist system. And when that melts down, the governments come to rescue them. And when the governments have rescued, the governments are bankrupt, and the governments tell you no money for health. 
Here's the money and disappeared. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like some it's a it's a Pakistani story. <laughs> Somebody brought two kilos of meat, and the meat disappeared. Somebody obviously stole it, and he's asking who stole it. When they couldn't give an answer, somebody said, the cat's eating it. So he said, bring the cat. <laughs> so he weighed the cat. The cat, the cat weighed two kilos. <laughs> he said, I found the meat, but where's the cat? <laughs> now, the, now the money, the money, the money, the money has certainly suddenly disappeared. It's on a merry-go-round. It's basically gone out of the pockets of working people into the, into the pockets of the bankers. That's where the money has, has gone. So, we know the, who the criminals are. And we should say, we will not pay a penny towards this war. And I keep on saying, at every meeting we hold, it's not my speech, or of Keith Bennett, or of Ranjit Brar, or anybody else, that will stop these wars. Only the working class has the power to stop these wars. Only the oppressed people have the ability to stop these wars. The resistance of the oppressed people in their own countries, combined with the refusal to cooperate with the criminal wars of imperialism by our own workers, is the only way forward. October Socialist Revolution in Russia. There was an intervention and a counter-revolutionary war made by imperialism, organized and led at the time by Britain. It, in the aftermath of the First World War, our heroic dockers in the ports of London, led by the legendary communist leader Harry Pollitt, organized the dockers and the dockers refused to load the ammunition and war material for the Russian front. What government can wage a war without the cooperation of the workers? Lloyd George had to call off the intervention, and that spelled death to, and, and to, to imperialism's attempt to actually uh, strangle the Soviet revolution at birth. And Lenin was never tired of giving that example. He said, we as a Soviet republic cannot exist without the help, sympathy of the people all over the world. Now, we count this story. This is done. And we take legitimate pride in the fact that our country did that. That whereas our ruling class waged war against the young Soviet Republic, our working class waged war against imperialism and helped the Soviet Union win that battle. Very, very important. Why can't that example be applied today? We go to the meetings of Stop the War Coalition and the Palestine Solidarity Conference and we raise it. No cooperation in the world. They say, how can you ask workers to withdraw their labor when they're already facing unemployment? These are the people who want to fight to the last drop of blood of the last Chinese, the last Palestinian, the last Libyan, the last Irishman, but they cannot actually be bothered to actually make any sacrifices in the struggle against imperialism. Every revolution means dislocation. It brings a lower standard of living to the people than they enjoyed up to then. But after a few years they recover and they're able to build a new society. It happened in China, it happened in Russia, would the sacrifices of the Chinese Revolution not be considered as worth it by us just because people had to die in that war? Modern China would not be what it is today. It would not be the second largest economy. It would not be the first manufacturing country in the world. It wouldn't be a country that within 60 years is able to defend itself and say imperialism will not come and imperialist pigs will not come and poke their snouts in our socialist garden, they keep out of it. <laughs> not only the Chinese people, 1.3 billion in a large country, but even small people, 22, 23 million, in DPRK are able to say, you will not come into our country. If you dare cross our borders, will give you a fitting rebuff. And that is the sort of stance that is established us. They may de denounce their leaders, they may denounce them undemocratic, they may denounce them as any, anything, anything else. But at the, the bottom line is, 
they have to have a grudging respect for the leadership in the DPRK because it stands firm at its post of defending the interests of the Korean people against predatory imperialist depredations. And that's the significance of it. Just to mention two other things briefly. You have been noticing that before. Not only is it the 58th anniversary of the end of the war against U.S. imperialism on the Korean Peninsula, this year and this month also marks the 90th anniversary of the founding of the Communist Party of China. <laughs> Whatever modern China is, Whatever its progress, it is, in my view, solely due to the Communist Party of China and the hundreds of millions of people who followed the line of the Communist Party of China to build a new China out of the rubble and ruin of the past and of imperialist depredations. May the CPC live long and continue to guide the Chinese people in building a better, stronger society, a better society, society with equality, society with fairness, and society with, with uh, planned production. So, Comrade Su, you too, can we send our greetings to the Communist Party of China, the government of the People's Republic of China, and the people of China on this very happy anniversary. of the storming of the Moncada barracks yes. in Cuba by Comrade Castro and his fellow revolutionaries. That attempt was not successful, but quite rightly the Cubans date the beginning of their revolution from that date because, as Lenin used to say, defeated armies learn well. And Comrade Castro and others learned well from that. And six years later, they were able, on New Year's Day, to build, to, 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 to bring into existence a new democratic Cuba. And it's a tiny country which is 90 miles from Florida. It basically has to live in the jaws of a large What's the word for that? Crocodile. The jaws of the crocodile. And actually to live in those conditions and provide free education, free health, and decent accommodation considering the, the lack of resources it has for its people is a remarkable thing. It's the only country in Latin America which is able to do that and has extended internationalist solidarity in the fields of liberation physically with arms, soldiers, and armaments, as well as in the field of health, education, etc. Mm. Cuban doctors go everywhere in the world to give help. There are some Pakistani comrades sitting here, they'll be able to tell you what happened during the earthquake. They offered help during Hurricane Katrina, mm. which the Americans out of peak reject, re, rejected it. But they didn't take this, that American imperialism tried to harm them. They, they should not actually try to help the people who are victims of, of, of this kind of disaster on the, on the, on the Gulf, Gulf Coast in America. And Cuban doctors have become well known, helping everybody. And Cubans have been able to stand on their principles, notwithstanding the dangers. Their leadership could easily sell out and have comfortable lives. But where would the Cuban people be? And Cuba is targeted by imperialism, not because it does any harm to America, but because it's such a shining and infectious example in Latin America, other countries want to follow it and are beginning to follow in the form of Venezuela and a number of other places like uh, Peru and Ecuador and, and, and Bolivia. Okay. So, comrades,
they are trying their level best to prevent the world going in the socialist direction. They're trying to prevent the world from achieving national liberation. But, but they won't. And perhaps I'll just finish on a lighter note. Two Jews sitting on a bench in a park, and they're looking very, very morose, and one says to the other, Abraham, what's the matter with you? He said, what should I tell you? What is it? My son's become a Christian. So the other one said, he's also, my son has also become a Christian. And they decided to then invoke the help of the Almighty, and they said, let's go to the synagogue and ask God what's happened. So they go to the synagogue and says, God, our sons have become Christians. What have we done wrong? And a voice appeared, obviously representing God, and the God said, funny you should say that. My son has become a Christian as well. <laughs> try, try, try as they may. Try as they may. Imperialism, in the end, will not be successful in stopping the forward march of these two powerful currents of our times, the movement for national liberation and the movement for socialism. Not because people in the third world and the working people are more clever than the other side. It is because the system itself is producing a crisis which cannot be solved. Can you just imagine a rich country like America where 40 million people have no health cover? Can you see a rich country like America cannot pay its debts? I dare not mention in case the Chinese comrades get annoyed with me because they tend to lose a lot of money if, if America does not pay its debts. You know, I mean, they, they are going to default. Now, whether the debt limit is raised beyond 14 trillion or not is irrelevant. The fact of the matter is American debts are so high, they can only continue to be paid while the interest rates are low. But the moment the dollar begins to slide, they will raise interest rates, they won't be able to pay their debts. And the only way they pay the foreigners who are owed a lot of money is through inflation, basically cheating. You know, you know if you were paid in the Weimar Deutsche Mark, okay. you wouldn't uh, get much payment, would you? You might as well be, uh, have one loaf of bread delivered for several thousand Deutsche Mark somebody owed you. So that's the situation in which we are. We have no reason to be despondent. The people of the world have every reason to look forward to even greater victories than we had so far. And believe you me, since the publication of the communist movement, the Com Communist Manifesto, our movement has made greater pro progress than any other social movement in the entire history of the world. Okay. I was watching on the BBC a three-part series on the life of Prophet Muhammad. The rest of the thing doesn't concern me, but Prophet Muhammad started preaching Islam in the year 610. And by the year 1623, which is 12 years later, 12, 13 years later, how many followers did he have? 150. People get very impatient with us. What progress have you made? They expect us to have made the Chinese Revolution, the October Revolution, the Korean Revolution. They somehow, irrespective of the conditions in which we live. And yet, perseverance and persistence brought Islam tremendous recruits in due course. Our movement is on the rise. It's the only relevant movement in the world. No religious movement, no fundamentalist movement, no movement sporting imperialism has any chance of being successful against us. We may be small, but again, to go Chairman Mao, you know, strategically, we are more powerful. Tactically, the other side is more powerful. They look all powerful, they've got all the weapons. You think a couple of shabby policemen will come with a couple of guns and disperse us. Yes, that is true. But in the end, the majority of the people will be on our sides and no guns will be able to defeat us. With these words, I once again congratulate the Korean comrades, the Chinese comrades, and the Cuban comrades, and thank you all for attending this meeting.